All right. There's your clap. Yes. You got to clap. I always forget. I, I do too. And then you're always trying to sink it. Uh, I think we bid it at like $11.25 a foot. Um, and thought, man, that is just a ton of money. It was a $90,000 job to do 8,000 feet of fence. And today, I can tell you, there is no way on God's green earth that I would ever go do fence for that cheap. And so we had to have the accountant basically tell us whether or not we made any money. And that was even kind of a stretch because if you give the accountant garbage, you're going to get garbage. I'm Mark Olson. Luke Gibson and I have a combined 50 years in construction as fence contractors. In that time, we've both experienced failures and success. We travel the country talking with other contractors who share their experiences in hopes that their stories can make you a more successful contractor. I've talked to a lot of people and people understand that I've got history and some knowledge as far as failure goes and wanted to know how that came about. So today I figured I would tell you my story um, not the story of success, but the story of failure that I went through to get to where I am today. Um, not a pleasant story, not something I'm super proud of. I'm not proud of the fact that it happened at all, I'm, but I am proud of the way we dealt with it and the way we've overcome it. We didn't let that beat us. Um, so there's, there's things in our lives that we can't go back and change, and this is one of those things. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes in the beginning and they carried forward with us. And so I'll tell you a little bit about um, the company that we had before Olson Fencing and why that company no longer exists. So if you're coming to us from the Powell Cody area in Wyoming and you've heard of the company Olson Fencing and you wondered what happened, this is the story of what happened there. If you're coming to us from somewhere else, glad to have you. So Olson Fencing started, um, got its start, I did fencing um, when I was in high school, uh, as young as 15 years old, I worked for a guy and we got paid peanuts and that's probably another story. If you want to hear that story about how we worked for a dollar an hour and got our start, let me know, put a comment. I'll tell that story later on. But we got our start when I was about 15 years old working for an old rancher and it just kind of progressed from there and did it off and on all the way through high school and all the way through college and got fired from my job. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> from a fencing job? No, I didn't get fired from a fencing job. I got fired as, uh, I was the youngest manager of a car quest in the western half, you know, west of the Mississippi. Um, and so that's a whole nother story. If you wanna hear that story, tell me about that. I got stories for days. Got fired from that job, ended up taking a job on an oil rig uh, for my brother Carl who is was the other owner of Olson Fencing and so I had a week on a week off and we decided that he was an electrician by trade and so we decided we'd start this fence company because I had not, I had a week of doing nothing so I figured heck well, well I'm, I just couldn't do nothing so we knew how to build fence I'd been doing it for a long time and we just decided, yeah, well, we'll go ahead and kind of start a fencing company. And that was in 2002. And so that was our official start paying taxes, doing things right, start day. Um, was in 2002. Uh, just really good at building fences. Um, kind of got a slow start. And I remember the first big job we ever got was kind of mid-summer. Uh, somebody said that they'd pay us $13,000 for a mile of fence, a mile of barbed wire fence. It might not even have been quite that much. But, man, there was a lot of work involved with it. And we thought we cut a fat hog, you know. So we bought a job trailer and we started, that's when we started buying equipment for one specific job. And just, I mean, we spent a lot of time on that job, but this is back when we thought making $30 an hour was good, you know, that was good. Um, we just arbitrarily set our labor rate at $30 an hour back then. Yeah, and I'm not telling you that because the way you price things is right or wrong, but to tell you that we just arbitrarily set that thought, you know, if we can make $30 an hour, that's pretty good. And I think that's how people get started in the fence industry and, and a lot of construction trades. They just kind of arbitrarily said it. Well, when I was working for somebody else, I was making 19. So if I can, and that's what I was getting paid at the rigs. We worked a ton of overtime, but you know, so if I'm making $19 an hour there, then $30 an hour, man, that's a lot of money. Without really taking any time to figure out, well, what does our rate need to be? So that was kind of like, if you're gonna count here, that's missed up number one. And so Nick, you just put a thing up on the screen and you'll say, number one, arbitrarily set our labor rate. 
We did not know our numbers, and that'll be kind of a reoccurring theme throughout this whole story. So we did that, um, and when we got this big job, we had kind of slowly built it up and got to the point where midsummer, my mother-in-law, uh, an opportunity presented itself, and I thought maybe I'd go directional drilling because they said that they were interested in people that had been to college a little bit, you know, which I had done by then, and they needed some people that had a little bit more computer savvy and a little more, um, maybe not as rough. I don't know a polite way to say this. Not as rough as typical rig hands. And so I kind of fit the mold and I went and interviewed with them and told my mother-in-law about it. And she said, you know, you got to decide what you want to do. Either you're going to start a fence company, you're going to go do that, or you're going to go into the oil field, but you need to figure out what you're going to do. So I made the decision right then and there, quit the oil rig job and went straight to fencing full time. Uh, Carl was still part time at, at that time, um, just helping on weekends and stuff like that. But that's about the time my younger brother, Alan, who also owns SWI, got started with the company. Uh, he was maybe a senior, junior, he was in high school, and so he just worked for us that summer. And I think he graduated the next year. Anyhow, got started doing that, um, quit, went full time, and things just kind of grew. In the first year, I think we did, you know, without even really trying and not being full time, either one of us, we did a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of work. And so uh, the next year, you know, that's when we started looking at, well, we wanted to get into a building and we wanted to do everything, you know, and, and our business grew rapidly. And I remember the banks telling us that, oh, you're growing too fast, you're going too fast. Well, the first thing they told us when we went to try and build a building on some property we had, uh, we did some projections, they wanted numbers, and so we put together all these projections and stuff and said, I think we're going to do $450,000 next year. And they said, ah, baloney. They didn't believe us at all. And turns out the next year we ended up doing like over $500,000. So in one year we went from doing, you know, 290,000 to 500,000. That was almost, you know, 100% growth. Um, so we started talking to the banks and then they're like, well, you're growing pretty fast. And we didn't really know what that meant. So I would say fast growth um, was number two, uh, the number two mistake and not fast growth like fa all, fa all fast growth is bad. We've had some fast growth as SWI. The problem was we didn't know how to manage it. You know, so we needed to, we started with nothing. We basically started with two pickup trucks and some hand tools and we had to build from nothing. Um, we had to get the phone ringing the first go around. We had to do all that stuff and all this was completely new to us. And I remember in the beginning, we kind of sit down we picked an accountant and the accountant we picked was just because that's where my mother and uh, my in-laws had had all their taxes done for their farm and stuff like that so we went and talked to them and said yeah we'll we'll do it and we basically were those people that went in there with the water receipts and said here's all our stuff and looked at them and said you know when you get this all figured out let us know if we made any money we didn't use QuickBooks in the beginning we didn't do any of that stuff I, I maybe I we used QuickBooks a little bit but we were still a train wreck we we knew how to get information into the checkbook in QuickBooks, but we had no idea any past that. It was just get all the stuff in there and then hopefully at the end we make some money. And I, I think we just used the default setting to set up QuickBooks. So we'd go to the accountant and say, did we make any money? And there's years and they're like, man, you made a lot of money. And they're like, now how in the world did we make some money? Because we feel poor as crap. And I remember them calling us. Uh, I was down in Orlando at FinSTech and the accountant that we were using called us up and said, man, you guys made a ton of money last year. You're going to have some tax problems. And we're like, boy, and I remember thinking, how do we make money? I feel poor. And so that was like mistake number two, not knowing how that could happen. We, you know, mistake number one is we didn't know our numbers or maybe we're on number three. Maybe that's three. At any rate, yeah. that was the next mistake not knowing our numbers and so we had to have the accountant basically tell us whether or not we made any money and that was even kind of a stretch because if you give the accountant garbage you're going to get garbage um and they you know and here's kind of mistake number four for us and one of the places we messed up too is is that when the accountant talked to us they kind of talked down to us and i remember going in there and him saying you know 
you know, how do you guys not know what you're doing? I mean, that's so stupid. You gotta, you gotta do this, that, and the other thing, but they would never teach us anything. They just basically looked at us like we had a third eye on the middle of our forehead and couldn't believe how stupid we were, but we're I'm mid twenties, 22, 23, 24 years old, something like that. And I, I didn't go to school for this. Um, I was just good at building fence and that's what most contractors are. They're just good at what they do. They don't have the business background. And so we were at their mercy and, and I, I remember how stupid they made me feel and I can't believe that I let them do that to me. And that's why I tell everybody now is, is that you've, you know, don't go to an accountant that makes you feel stupid. You should, you should be comfortable with them and if you don't understand things, they should be able to teach you how to do things. Um, I didn't know how to read a profit and loss. I didn't know how to read a balance sheet. I didn't know any of that. We were 100% reliant, reliant upon their information to tell us whether or not we made money. And so then as things kind of grew in year number two and three, we needed even more and more money. So we started going to the banks and talking to the banks and uh, a local bank actually, we kind of piecemealed some financing to buy a job trailer and some things like that. I mean, all we knew about banks is how we bought trucks, you know, personally um, from a consumer side. We didn't really know a whole lot about the business banking side of things. And so that opened up a whole new can of worms when we started talking to banks and needing more money to buy skid steers and, you know, inventory and things like that. So that, that was kind of another piece. And I remember in 2000, I think it was 2003, we got the largest job that we'd ever gotten because I was one of those people that I just wanted to grow. Um, I just wanted to get big. I'd seen other people in our area and they just wanted to stay small. And that's fine if you want to stay small, there's nothing wrong with that. But I always wanted to see how big I could make something. I'm just not one of those people. I'm extremely driven. And even at the point our company is, is I'm always looking for ways, okay, what's the next growth avenue? And so we looked at going from residential, which is where we got our entry. First, we started out agriculturally because that's where we got a real start. Then we kind of grew into the residential market and got a little bit into the commercial and started learning chain link, which was a complete disaster. Um, and we got this great big job doing an airport and lander. This is 2003. So we went out and we bought a camper uh, and I bought that, I think, personal credit is how we did most everything in the beginning. So I bought this camper to live in when we were on the job so we didn't have to pay hotels. And there was three of us that went down there to do the job. It was my younger brother, Alan, who was, again, the other owner of SWI, as many of you may know, and a guy named Spencer. We hired a college kid. And remember, that was, uh, I think we bid it at like $11.25 a foot. Um, and thought, man, that is just a ton of money. It was a $90,000 job to do 8,000 feet of fence. And today, I can tell you, there is no way on God's green earth that I would ever go do fence for that cheap. Never went and looked at the site, didn't do any of that stuff uh, to kind of do our due diligence. And not that that was a huge problem. Luckily, the contractor we were working for was really good and they went and bladed us a path and it was through some rough terrain and stuff like that, but turned out all right, uh, dug through the rocks. We spent a whole month on the job. But what we didn't think about is we didn't think about what it was gonna take financially to do a project of that size. So we, you know, we had to get some terms with our, our vendors and stuff like that and start getting those terms with the vendors. And then we get done with the job and that's when we first started to learn about retainage, which is the 10% that they hold until the project's all complete. So we kind of started running short on cash because we'd run the whole job and hadn't been paid. It wasn't like residential where you go do the work and maybe even collect a deposit up front and then you finish the finish the job and then they pay the other half. This is 100% on you. You're out of pocket for the materials. You're out of pocket for the labor. You're out of pocket for everything. And then maybe after 60 or 90 days, you'll get paid for the, the work. And so ended up going to my in-laws and we had to get some money from them and uh, started to learn about retainage. So finally we get most of the money, um, but not all the money. And we had to wait for that last 10%, which was $9,000. I mean, on this particular job is nine grand. So that kind of hurts when that's maybe your whole profit margin. And that's where we'll pick up. I've got to fix a gate operator and that's going to be in another video on our channel, that'll be on SWI Fences channel. What we're gonna do is we're gonna show you the difference between a Mighty Mule operator and one of the operators that we install.
So if you're at all interested in that, be sure to check out SWIFence.com or SWI Fence on YouTube and you can see all that footage there. We're going to fix this gate real quick and then we'll be back.